Look at that. I'm so much better this year. I even didn't start talking and have you hit that while I was talking. I'm just amazing what experience does for you. Really? And you look younger each year. <laughs> even better. Even better. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. You were always my favorite. So I'm going to order the Finance Committee on Tuesday, September 12th, 2023 at 4 p.m. This meeting is being audio and video recorded. Um, may I have an approval? Of, oh, we have a script still. Look at that, one step forward, two steps back. Um, we're using Zoom for this meeting, which allows the public to participate in the meeting as an attendee. The chair can request that members of the public provide their names for purposes of keeping accurate minutes of the meeting. Attendees have to register, um, they'll join in listening mode, and then I will call on those who have raised their hand in the order in which they are raised, and all questions and comments should be directed through the chair. As a preliminary meeting, this is Denise Cronow, the chair of the Finance Committee. Permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative, starting with Peter. Here. Uh, Jill. You're muted, Jill. Still muted, Jill, but we heard, I saw your lips move twice, so there we go. Here. Sorry. <laughs> Jeremy. Here. Chris. Here. Steven. Here. Thank you. Uh, staff, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Uh, Maria. Here. Ryan. In attendance. Susan. Here. Libby. Present. Rick. Here. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Good afternoon. This open meeting of the Finance Committee is being conducted remotely pursuant to Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting will feature public comment for this meeting of the Finance Committee. We're convening by video conference on Zoom. Please note the meeting is being recorded. Don't share your screen. Anything you broadcast will be captured by the recording. Um, I will introduce each speaker on the agenda. After they conclude the remarks, I'll ask the members if they have any further comments, questions, or motions. Uh, please remember to mute your phone or computer when not speaking. And um, yeah, each vote will be taken by roll call vote. So there we go. Thank you. Um, may I have an approval of the agenda? So moved. Second. Second. Thank you. Um, roll call, Peter? Aye. Jeremy? Aye. Jill? Aye. Stephen? Aye. Aye. Chris? Aye. Okay, thank you. Um, I am now going to open the meeting to public comment. So if any member of the public that is in attendance would like to raise their hand. And I will close the public comment. Okay, so the first item on our agenda is a review of the fiscal year 2025 preliminary budget projections. Maria is sharing screen and I will turn it over to Libby and Brian as to who goes first. So just a quick intro, and then I'm going to turn it over right over to Brian. We've been doing this annually for the last several years, having a meeting with the Finance Committee prior to our sort of unveiling of these preliminary projections at the select board level. And see if you sort of run it by you all first, see if you have any questions, if anything jumps out at you, if you have any suggested recommendations or anything like that with respect to the presentation. And it's very, very preliminary. There are a lot of unknowns. We're going to review some of those at the end of the presentation. Um, but this is where we are right now. And this is sort of how we kind of kick off the um, budget development process. So Brian's going to take us through the first several slides with the projected revenues and expenses. Brian. Uh, thank you, Libby. Um, thank you, Madam Chair and FinCom. Um, so as we begin this process in September, which is typically when we've um, begun it, we do give this preliminary projection to uh, the FinCom. So starting for fiscal 25, the fiscal 25 projected levy limit starts at 106,281,000, which is based on where we're projecting fiscal 24 uh, allowable levy limit to end up. Um, one thing to keep in mind is the fiscal 24 levy limit is still a moving target with respect to the new growth calculation, um, given the fact that we're still working, finalizing, reviewing permits and completed work at residences to try to capture as much new growth as possible. 
So the 106 281 that we have is the allowable levy limit for fiscal 24, which becomes the 25 starting point. Um, may change and most likely will change. Most likely new growth will probably go to a little over a million, probably just under 1.2 million. If it does end up where we currently think that it may end up, we will certainly alter um, a little bit of the projection for new growth for fiscal 25. So when we factor in the allowable 2.5% increase in real and personal property tax revenue, the new growth of 700,000, we have a fiscal 25 projected levy limit of 109,638,000. To that, we add the debt exclusions from the debt service amortization table. Those are able to be raised outside of the levy limit and those for 20, fiscal 25 currently stand at 9,983,000. We're projecting at this point as we begin the capital process, um, capital program process, a debt exclusion recommendation of 850,000, which will bring our maximum allowable levy to be raised in real and personal property taxes to $120,471,000. Next slide. So <clears throat> for fiscal 25, we are, carrying at the starting point today, the same projections for fiscal 24 as we work through uh, the fiscal 24 year. Um, as an example, rooms and meals tax, we increased in fiscal 23, we received about $13.4 million, I believe it was. Um, we increased that budget to 12 million. The September payment will actually come on September 29th. That payment for rooms tax, room occupancy tax, it's for the period of June, July, and August. And that's usually a good indicator of where our number will be, um, not only for fiscal 24, but it'll give us a roadmap to where fiscal 25 may end up. So this is typically how we've done it. And um, we continue to work with departments on a lot of this. One, one area that we will most likely also probably raise a little bit more is the investment income in fiscal 24, or 23, excuse me, through the hard work of our treasurer, um, Mindy, we generated about $2.4 million worth of investment income in the general fund based on cash flow forecasting and um, working with the banks and increasing the rates every time the Fed increased the rates and also working with our um, investment advisor at Morgan Stanley. Um, we were able to generate substantial investment income in the general fund and fiscal 24. This first quarter will give us a good indication of where how we're doing and it would appear that we may be able to raise the investment income uh, number from 750 to most likely over a million dollars for, for fiscal 25. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so the entirety of the revenue picture for the town, which is really the basis of um, what the expenditure picture will look like, the levy limit of 120,471,000, abatements and exemptions, we're recommending the same 400,000 based on discussions with the assessor's office. Um, it's been pretty consistent and we've not needed more than that on an annualized basis. So we're staying current with that. Local estimated receipts, 20,855,000 currently. And then state local aid at 4,822,000, which is exactly the number that was um, on the cherry sheet for fiscal 24. Um, this may change slightly depending, but since the state hasn't even started their budget um, process yet and does not actually get into their um, they were agreed between the House, the Senate, and the governor's office, their revenue projection. We're level funding this, but if the governor is consistent with past practice, at a minimum, the unrestricted account would go up by whatever they project the revenue growth in the Commonwealth to be. And we're hopeful that they'll continue to make progress in um, more fully funding Chapter 70 as well. So all told, we're projecting revenue of 145749000 for fiscal 25. <clears throat> Brian, so, do you want to see if there's any questions before you keep moving on? Yeah, sure, I'm sorry. Sorry about that. No, that's okay. I didn't, we didn't say up front. Does anybody have a question of on the revenue side for Brian? Jill? Uh, yeah, Brian, did you, um, have you considered like if we, if the town votes to change a short-term rental, I know it doesn't change the tax amount, but, you know, will it, will rentals go down a little bit? Do you all consider that? I see you flatlined it, so... Um, we'll probably look at what happened um, when we get the September payment, which would be for June, July, and August and see, because I think it's the paper is put out that, um, and a lot of other people have um, opined that revenue or rentals were down this year. So a little bit anyway, we may end up 
adjusting that number downward, but we're waiting until the end of September to see. And I, I think it would be difficult to project the absolute impact of the changes at the annual town meeting, uh, quite honestly, because some of them would mean that I'd have to project how many houses may change hands and would reduce the amount of um, turnovers that would have. And that would be very difficult for me to be able to do, quite frankly. Yeah. Do you do you anticipate having a lower re, um, return this year based on just what you're seeing in the news? Um, well, I can tell you that last year, the first quarter was actually down on a year over year basis, and it was made up in the second quarter substantially. So um, I think that depending on what it looks like, will really, if it's substantially down from a last year's number, then yes, I probably would ratchet this number down. But if it's relatively similar to where we were, you know, last year, you know, within a few percentage points, and I probably will leave this roughly at 12 million until we get closer to um, into the, the September, October, November payment, which comes in December. Because the two of those payments combined is we, we generate between 85 and 93% of all room occupancy revenue in those two payments between September and uh, December. Right. But so you don't really know what that's going to be. Now, they don't tell you before they kind of send no, it. No, they don't. They just send me a wire. Okay. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Jill. Yep. Anybody else have a question for Brian? Just a comment, uh, Peter. Um, I don't think even if it, regardless of what happens, Jill, I don't think there's any, it will have any impact on revenue for next year. Um, you know, but the, there's just really no way anything can get en enacted quick enough. Um, and considering if, if the grandfathering goes through, um, certainly the first year, there won't be much, much change in revenues. Thank you, Peter. Anyone else? Okay, over to expenses. Thanks. Thanks, Brian. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> so for the town for fiscal 25, we're projecting salaries as a starting point um, before any expense increase request of 26677000 uh, which is about $1.5 million above the fiscal 24 projection. It takes into account any and all um, currently approved contractual labor agreements. The school, as most people know, uh, probably saw, has recently ratified the teacher contracts. The school, business, school CFO has given us the rollover number of 32944000 which doesn't take, does take into account um, the contractual increases for the teachers. It's important to note that both of these numbers, salary numbers, does include the expectation that in fiscal 25, any open positions that are unfilled would be filled. So between the town and the school, all of those, we estimate, we're, we're budgeting that they would all be filled. Transfer to the community school, we have projected the same 600,000 for the fiscal 25 year. All told salaries of 60,221,000 for fiscal 25. Starting point for operating expenses in the town is 9.9 .9 million, which is a decrease from the 11.5 and 24 because the starting point that we start with is only the non, it includes no one-time expenses, which are all funded by free cash. So our starting point, we back those out. So that is only ongoing annual expenses that have been included on a year over year basis. Mosquito control is increased by two and a half percent from 181,000 to 185,000. Operating expenses from the school, 6,230 and 24, projected to increase to 6.4 million. We did back out the EIR and there is an increase in special education tuitions and cost um, non-staff or personnel related that the CFO already know, does know about. So we have plugged those in to, to this projection. Operating expenses as a starting point, $16.6 .6 million. Again, this does not include any expense increase requests for the town or any one-time increases that would be funded by free cash. Medical, medical insurance in total, projecting at 17,968,000, which is a 10% increase, which is what our um, insurance consultant has suggested we start with. It's important to remember that we're only at this point where you're exactly two and a half months into the new fiscal year. The majority of the claims in any new fiscal year are what is known as run out claims from the prior year. So they, they don't, in, they're not, we're not into the current year claims yet. So this number 10% is where we typically have started. It typically has come in um, lower as we progress through the budget cycle and 
as we work to refine that number, any opportunity to decrease the in the 10% will, will certainly be taken advantage of. Total general and other insurances, including laborers union pension, workers comp, uh, life insurance costs for the town, com unemployment compensation, and then general insurance is projected to go to 4,782,000. The majority of this increase all in the general insurance line, which is where our property liability, motor vehicle insurances uh, reside. The majority of this and the main driver of this is our property insurance is continuing to increase at what we really are deeming almost unsustainable rates at this time. So we are working with our insurance consultants to start looking at alternative development of alternative programs or alternative ways to insure the properties and the levels that we're insuring at to try to find a way to ratchet those premiums down. Retirement is projected to go to 7,415,000, which is an eight and a half percent increase, which is consistent with the Barnstable County retirement schedule that was approved by PARAC. Debt service total is 12,447,000, of which $9.9 .9 million is debt exclusions. The rest is all financed within the levy limit over the last few years. Projected total operating expenses for the general fund, $119,436,000. And I'll take any questions on this first section if, if that is okay, Madam Chair. Yes, absolutely. Thanks, Brian. Everybody, I have to scroll because you're not all fitting on one screen. I don't see any hands raised. Okay. Onwards, Brian. Thank you. Uh, other articles, including special fund transfers, starting with unpaid bills, those would be funded by free cash. The county assessment at 183,000. Health and Human Services, we have started at 650. There has been some internal discussion about whether that number should increase, but at this point, we're recommending and starting at the 650. Special purpose stabilization for substance abuse, um, there still is money in that, and there's still an open question about whether we would have, be able to have that funded or not. So we have projected the $175,000 allocation, which would be administered by CRC. Reserve fund and other post-employment benefit trust fund, we are recommending the same $500,000 raise and appropriate consistent with fiscal 24. Affordable housing trust fund, 1,013,000 is the remaining amount of money on the $2 million that, or $1.6 million, excuse me, that we gave them Three years ago through Article 10, um, we have borrowed permanently some of that funding for those borrowing authorizations. This is the remainder of that until it's permanently borrowed and then it would get rolled into the debt service line. Total school minimum capital funding, 1.5 million. Given the fact that local estimated receipts have been um, increasing on a year over year basis, this number um, is comprised of the real and personal property tax collections as well as local estimated receipts. So we've seen a substantial increase uh, this year over last year with that number. The general fund transfers, uh, total of uh, transferred to Ireland home, 5.3 million, increase of two and a half percent for that override. Solid waste enterprise fund, the first transfer, 4,033,000, which is also two and a half percent increase. The additional subsidy from 2012, 2.9 million. The additional subsidy from fiscal 23, which is a permanent override, is increased 2.5% to 3.8 million. And the Affordable Housing Trust Fund override approved in fiscal 24 of 6,662,000, which is a 2.5% increase. Transfer to stormwater, as everybody's aware, last year we established a stormwater enterprise fund. Um, given that it's in its infancy at this point, it will continue to be funded through a transfer from the general fund for the foreseeable future. Other statutory expenditures, which are cherry sheet offsets. The majority of these are all, is the, the money to fund the NRTA, the town's portion of the NRTA. We've projected a level funding because as I mentioned with the cherry sheet revenue side, the state has not even begun their budget deliberations. So we have level funded both sides of that. That would be 1,461,000. Total projected general fund expenses, including other articles and general fund budgetary transfers, $148,741,000. When matched against the projected revenue of 1,445,749,000, excuse me, we currently stand today at a projected deficit of 2,991,000. 
I would caution everybody on this, um, on the Zoom meeting here, that this is very preliminary and is not unlike past years where we have begun or projected deficits at the starting point. And as things um, became a little more clear as we worked through it, we were able, we were able to, to fund the, the programs we would like to and have turned that into a surplus. But at this time, our uh, excess levy capacity, this is where we're starting based on what we know, um, given the environment we're in today. And I'll be happy to answer any questions on this page, Madam Chair. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Jeremy? Uh, Brian, just to understand the municipal accounting, it mm -hmm. seemed like the prior page, which was more of an income and expenses page, this almost looks like this is a deferred working capital page where we were obligated to make these payments in, by prior periods. And for some reason, they don't go through the income statement, but they are cash obligations. Am I, am I uh, looking well, at this kind of the right way? Well, these two are these two are basically the the expense pages of an income statement. They're they're in total. So these are so all of the transfers to the general fund, which total about twenty seven million, are all current year obligation. It would be a fiscal twenty five obligation. They're not deferred or anything. They're they're obligations that we have automatically by prior votes. So, okay. Uh, so in many ways, so the, the twenty seven million the general fund. The first page, Jeremy, would be the general fund operating, which is Article 8. And all of these are, so as an example, health and human services, the 650 and the 175 are in Article 9. All of these on this page are other articles or, or are approved or voted in um, the enterprise, enterprise fund budgets or Article 10, for as an example. So these are not funded through Article 8. These are funded through other articles within the warrant itself. Okay, I understand. Oh, just a quick question on the um, the one hundred and seventy five thousand that the mm -hmm. the voters voted on. Um, they, my, my understanding is there's still an RFP out for um, a whole host of services to fill that. Is that correct. correct? That is correct. Okay. And the expectation is that it'll be back shortly and awarded. Um, I believe it may be this week, and it'll be awarded by next week or the week after. That's the, the timeline that CRC has established. And at okay. this point, because okay. free cash is not certified, we have not made a provision for that increase for that edit, for that 175. <clears throat> Other questions for, thank you, Jeremy. Other questions for Brian? Okay, next page, two BDs. Uh, and this is where I will um, have the town manager go through the uh, to be determined. Thank you, Brian. Okay, so as you can tell by the title of the slide, a lot of these things are to be determined. We are bringing them up so that people can have them in their minds as we go through the process. There are still things that are not known yet, settled yet, figured out yet. One of the first one being the select board's priorities. The select board has a um, annual strategic plan retreat on October 24th. They had a governance meeting and um, a, a sort of an interim strategic plan meeting over the summer. And we expect there may be some new priorities and or some new items that get worked into the strategic plan, but we're not quite sure yet. And that will be revealed through their retreat process. So there may be some things that we're going to be working into the budget as a result of that. Town administration priorities. We have two categories here, new and continuing. One of our new priorities is staffing of the housing and real estate office. So currently, or until recently, we have basically had a kind of a combined housing and real estate office with the housing director, a real estate specialist, and an office administrator type of person. And as we are trying to secure rental housing for town employees, manage the rental housing for town employees, both housing that we own and housing that we are renting, and concurrently trying to deal with tenant issues, um, placement issues, bargaining issues, and potential acquisitions, we are finding that we are woefully understaffed in this area. And if housing is the, a very high priority of the select board, we need to step up 
our game on handling town employee housing issues. So Rick Sears, Greg Tivnan, and Tucker Holland have worked out a structure for a, a, a more comprehensively staffed um, organizational um, way to handle these things. And it's kind of, it's not totally different to what we have now, other than the reporting and a, a couple of more positions and some more focused um, emphasis on certain areas that we're struggling with. So that will involve, as, as you all know, Tucker is going to be departing most likely by the end of October. So we're in the process of seeking his replacement now. The housing director will report to the town manager. The real estate specialist position, the incumbent in that position has been out on medical leave since May. And he is going to hopefully be somewhat returning in a remote capacity on a on diminished work schedule very shortly. And we are also retaining um, newly retired planning director, former planning director, Andrew Vorce, to help with some very specific real estate issues. And his work is limited by uh, the re restrictions on what retirees can do for municipalities. In any event, um, we are hoping to, we, we actually have funding for a real estate property manager, and we're in the process of developing a job description for that now. That's a new position in the current fiscal year, fiscal 24. We are probably going to be seeking funding for a paralegal for the real estate office in fiscal 25, and down the road a little bit, perhaps in fiscal 26, an additional office administrator for the housing part of the operation. So we are working on all of these things, but quite frankly, are finding ourselves a bit overwhelmed with managing all of our housing and real estate obligations. Continuing priorities are everything that's shown there. And again, they are continuing. Uh, Libby? Yes. Okay, this is Jeremy. Can, yes. I, can I ask just a question on the housing sure. for a second? Yep. It, is it at all simplistic to think of the needs in two buckets there's the union employees and then there's the non-union management employees and are they completely different pools for the housing and have you did you learn anything in your union contracts because um i would be certain that unions are loath to give one party a little bit of something and the other party because of where they live they don't uh, don't need it so that's an excellent question. And there's a, a couple of different, um, there's a couple of answers to that. Number one, one of our directives in the current bargaining from the board was to seek language in every collective bargaining contract that allows the town to provide housing to union and non-union employees without the need to bargain and without any um, ramifications from placing union or non-union pe union people in town secure housing. And almost all of the units have agreed to that language at this point, except for the unsettled units. We also are working on- So, so just, so Libby, that, so that effectively uh, allows you not to have two buckets of employees, but just one bucket of employees. Pretty much, yes. Okay. I, I would say the answer to that is yes. Um, Again, with the exception of the units that are not settled. So that does make it a little easier. We're, we're trying to sort of maintain a, a list of town employees who need housing in an emergency way, in a soon to be needed way. And, and it's daunting, to be honest. But anyway, it's, it's basically hopefully going to be one pool, ultimately. Yes. Okay. So the continuing priorities are all listed here. I won't go through every one of them in detail, except I'll highlight a couple. The solid waste long-term planning is well underway and it's picking up a bit as the waste services agreement <clears throat> is scheduled to expire in 2025. Denise Cronow is on our, uh, the town administration solid waste long-term planning work group, as well as Howard Matz from the capital program committee and uh, select board member Brooke Moore and some other staff people. Public outreach and communications is something the board requested the town administration focus on last November <clears throat> during their strategic planning retreat. And we are working on a lot of things to improve our communications with the community, with ourselves, our employees, and up, 
you know, keeping the website up to date, um, trying to review metrics of public responses to things and get information out there in a um, in a factual and non-biased manner. Facilities is a real area where we are struggling as well. Our facilities department within the public works, facilities division within the public works department is very understaffed for the number of Build municipal buildings that they are charged with maintaining. So we are working on how to deal with that. Continuing with employee retention and succession planning um, and um, recruiting strategies, infrastructure and capital projects funding. So you might've heard me mention earlier to make sure that the finance committee and the capital program committee are aware of an agenda item at the select board meeting next Wednesday, September 20th. We're, we're calling it I'll just tell you what we're calling it as a nickname, the collision projects presentation. And, and really what that means is we have some very large, big ticket capital items on our immediate horizon within the next three to five years, including but not limited to <clears throat> a new DPW facility, the new Our Island Home, the new Senior Center, the, Bar the um, Baxter Road Alternative Access Project, the Somerset Sewer Needs Area Extension, and there's a couple of others. And because of the way they are coming up in the capital improvement plan and the planning process in general, we, we're concerned that they will collide at one or more, you know, at, at together at a town meeting. So we're working on how to not have that happen, but it is going to be uh, a little difficult. And they are uh, large ticket items, like I said, as, as you know. And concurrently, or at the same meeting, we are hopefully getting a debt service overview from our financial advisor through Brian, or I'm not sure if Cinder is coming on or not, Brian, but we obviously would want to look at ways to flatten out the debt service. So take on new debt as old debt, older debt is retiring. That That is not as easy as it sounds or might seem because we don't have a lot of debt retiring and then next three to five years. So we're trying to, you know, work on ways to make it less of an impact to the taxpayer. Project management and grant administration are things that we are continuing to a little bit struggle with. Project management, we definitely have a deficit in staff to manage all the projects that are out there. And we're trying to figure out how to get at it without having to continually hire consultants that are far more expensive than employees, yet it's very hard to find qualified employees at our salary ranges. Um, grant administration is something that we are probably going to propose um, a position where we've just basically started talking about it internally. It, it, it won't be somebody who goes out and gets every single grant because each grant has a lot of, you know, depending on the area of the grant, it has different the grant applications have different requirements, different um, re reporting necessities, different in-kind contributions, different ways to manage them, and they're four different things. So we're thinking more that we need a grant administrator who, once we have secured a grant, could help manage it. Stormwater is an ongoing priority. We obviously have, stormwater is not a new management need for the town, but it has definitely increased over the last three or four years with more stormwater issues in more places around the island and with climate change and sea level rise and continued development, it is going to remain a, a growing issue. Public safety, of course, is just a continuing priority to make sure that our public safety departments have the personnel and equipment they need to function. And central fleet maintenance uh, is something that we need to focus on. We completed a central fleet maintenance assessment study this year it has something like 37 recommendations. Not all of them are monetary, but, but a good amount of them are, including a position which we are um, seeking to budget in fiscal, uh, no, it is budgeted, sorry, in fiscal 24. And ultimately we are going to need more mechanics in order to have an effective central fleet program, mechanics are hard to find. So it's just a challenge. Citizen warrant articles, moving into that. As you all know, we don't typically include appropriations for citizen warrant articles that require or are seeking an appropriation. 
in the upcoming fiscal year budget. And sometimes we find ourselves having to figure out funding them anyway, if they are approved or in some way endorsed. School priorities will be determined. They are definitely coming. Free cash, as Brian mentioned, is hoped to be certified second week of October. Local receipts, I think Brian mentioned those as well with health, health insurance and local aid. The Nantucket Regional Transit Authority, I know I don't know yet if there are going to be service changes there, but the new NRTA administrator, Gary Roberts, has been working very hard to secure additional state funds for new equipment and or operations. So hopefully we won't see any big change in our cherry sheet assessment for the NRTA. PFAS is an ongoing issue and we're probably going to be getting into additional need to fund um, mitigation of PFAS in water sources around the island. Potential fee adjustments, this, this comes up at board meetings um, about once a year whenever we're talking about a particular fee increase and there's there's some thinking that perhaps the town's fees that can be increased should be by the cost of living on an annual basis. So Sue Carmel is doing a review of the fees for every department and determining, which will help us determine if we were to increase the ones that may be increased that aren't already at the statutory maximum, is it worth in increasing them by the cost of living, say. Um, and lastly, the competing capital priorities, which I've pretty much already covered with the uh, so-called collision pre presentation at next week's board meeting. And I see there's some questions. Thank you, Libby. Um, Jeremy, is your hand up from before or is it a new hand up? That was from before. I, okay. Do I have to lower it? I don't know. Yeah, you have you have the option to lower it. Then over to you, Chris. Sorry, I moved around on the screen that I couldn't find the mute, the mute button. Um, Libby, can you give us a little overview of how this sort of school priority to process works? Um, just, you know, the, the school committee brings that to you and then you guys kind of negotiate or how, how does that process work? Um, well, it's certainly not all that straightforward or in writing, but we work very well with the school administration and we start meeting right around now. In fact, I think we have a meeting with them later this week or next week. And they start letting us know their priorities. <clears throat> we review ours. We talk about their so-called roll forward number. They've just completed bargaining and negotiations. So there will be, those will, will clearly need to be worked into the fiscal 25 budget. And we kind of share how important, I mean, we all, we both feel that our priorities are very important, but we can't fund everything. So we, we just work it out, I guess so I would say. And you work it out with administration, then that goes through the school committee for them to kind of, where, yep. where, how does the approval process work with the committee? Well, um, as far as I know, this, the uh, superintendent gets budgets from all of the principals and the facilities and community school and works those into, you know, they, they, they have a, um, a very similar process as we do. They ask their departments for their proposals, they review them, they pare them down, <clears throat> most likely. And then the school administration and town administration discuss them. We do what we can for them with, while keeping our priorities in mind as well. And things that might might be um, mandatory, not, not discretionary. And we work what we can into our budget recommendations. We go to our board in the beginning of December. I think we're going December 13th or somewhere around then. And we go to the school committee a couple of weeks later. Or actually, I guess last year we went in early January. I think we're doing that again this year. And <clears throat> meanwhile, the superintendent is starting to review her budget with her departments and with the committee. I, I don't re recall right off the top of my head if they have a little sort of a school committee subgroup on the budget, but they ultimately, I believe, have a statutory requirement to recommend a number for town meeting, and that number is printed in the your motion to Article 8. Yeah, okay, thanks. And I know they always sort of as a courtesy come to us and have a discussion about it, but it always feels kind of like a courtesy, which is fine. Um, all right, that's helpful. Thank you. I mean, I suppose that uh, we're pretty lucky, I would say, in talking to other town managers, 
and having a little bit of knowledge about how, how other budgets work. First of all, we're not in a regional situation with more than one town. So we don't have to worry about, you know, who has to pay more or less. And we have a very good relationship with school administration. Um, a lot of towns don't. And so I think we're, we're lucky from that perspective. And I think we each respect what is going on in the other other's organization. And we're all on one team and there's only so much money to go around. Great, thank you. Sure. Any other questions for Libby? Okay, Joanna and then Jill. Thanks. Um, that was a good presentation overview. I, I have a couple of questions. One is I am hearing that the cannabis grant is going away. Is, can, is that true? And what's the plan for either replacing that money or the process for reviewing the money that's allocated to the CRC? That's the first question. So I don't know. Um, if you mean the community, uh, the host community um, agreement payments, um, we have not 100% determined whether or not those are going away, but the Cannabis Control Commission is proposing, as you all may have heard, new regulations, which include basically phasing out um, community benefit payments. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't phase out the portion of the tax that the municipalities receive. That would continue to go into the um, special purpose stabilization fund for that purpose. But I don't, I don't think right now we have any kind of plan to replace the money that we've been getting through those community benefit um, agreements. Okay, that was my first question. Second question, um, yay about the grant writer administrator person. Um, what, so I think the idea of having an administrator is really smart, but I'm wondering if on the other side of that, you're budgeting uh, money to hire a grant writer, right? So the I get that the administrator would be the person who is managing like the disbursement and the reporting and the project aspect, aspect of it, but is there, are we hiring or are we allotting some money to hire like a grant writer consultant to actually write the grants? Um, I think what we actually are considering, and again, this is very preliminary. We do not have a recommendation that's formulated right now, but what our most recent discussion has been around is to fund a, a grant administration function within town administration, which would include funds to engage consultants to prepare grants rather than having an on-staff grant writer because the grants are often so specialized that one person is not really able to effectively write grants for a whole variety of situations. So this so this would be money that would be allocated to hire people with different with, with the appropriate expertise in different areas. Yes. And I managed not... by one staff person. That's the idea right now. Okay. Yes. So can, can I just add to that on a question, Libby? Yep, sure. Um, our municipalities in such a uh, uh, proposition allowed to pay success fees to, a, in this case, a grant writer or whatever entity uh, exists? Because there, um, there are such firms that do this um, quite a bit in the private sector for grants. Yeah, I think it depends on what grant you're going after and how much it is. And I I, I think, um, I wanna say we've, we've done this before with a particular grant that we did not end up getting. Um, so I'm not sure of the definitive answer to that question at this moment. I would have to either defer to Brian or we'll have to get you that answer. And are you um, aware of other municipalities who, um, are organized to try and go get these grants because there there are quite a few of them in different parts of government around this. and and one area I am aware that does this quite successfully are very few of the largest uh, research universities where they will have a centralized office to help their scientists go and get uh, such sure. things. I mean, yeah, I, if I can jump in for a second, I think what um, one of the things that 
maybe not everybody's aware of is actually do get quite a lot of grants. They're just not very publicized. So we're not sitting here ignoring money that's out there. Um, and the second piece of that, so that's something that I think we could do better on in terms of just letting people know what we've already gotten grants for, because there was um, several grants that came in last year um, that I'm aware of that, of course, I don't remember now. Um, so I'm not that helpful. Brian probably knows better than I do. And then secondly, um, we just always have to remember, too, that we are on Nantucket. So a lot of people probably don't consider us to be um, needy in a certain way. You know, I guess in coastal resiliency, we would be a big, you know, front of the line. But in terms of some of the other things, I think it's a little bit more of a challenge to pr pr um, prove need than it would be if you were in, you know, a, a suburb of Pittsburgh. So I think those are some of the things to consider as we um, talk about this. But Libby, go ahead. You were going to answer. Oh, I was just going to say, um, we we do get grants. We do seek them. We don't have a great success rate. And I don't think it's necessarily because we don't have a good grant application. It's a lot of times what you just said, Denise, we're, we're not high up on the list of communities that are suffering. Or competing with people whose need is greater. I would, I would just phrase it that way, probably. Yes, that's better. Yeah. <laughs> um, Other questions, Joanna? I, I did have one more question, which is, I'm just curious about, you know, and I know that we've talked about it before, so maybe I'm going to try to approach this in a little bit of a different way, but the pro, the projects that we completed, like this, like somehow working out a status update on funded projects, whether it was a capital project from two years ago or a capital project from last year, because the pro we vote, the project gets funded. And then I'd like to know year to year where we are in the project. And so that we can kind of track to completion. And we have talked about this a bunch of other times, but I think it would be helpful because I think that in some cases we are we're completing these projects and we don't know, and it would be good to know when they ended and what the final cost of the projects were, because uh, I think that benefits everybody that knowledge. So, um, if you were the FinCom rep to the Capital Program Committee, I think you would um, gather that information. So maybe Sue, we can let the FinCom know when Capcom is reviewing prior year projects and then they could may maybe attend if they wanted to. Great idea, thank you. Other questions? No, okay. I mean, I thank you for this. It's always good to have an early look on the 20th. So our next agenda item is date of next meeting. So on Wednesday the 20th, we're invited to the select board um, they're going to get the same presentation and um, they're also going to hear about the, um, um, what's it, the CERN collision thing in Switzerland? Yeah, where all the projects hit at once, right? <laughs> and uh, so the, there's that. Um, on Thursday the 21st at 4 p.m. is our first, is the public hearing for the 20, I think it's 20 articles, right? In the special town meeting warrant. Uh, that is in person, that is, well, it's hybrid, but it's obviously mostly in person. It will be in the community room. Um, Stephen will be chairing that meeting for the simple reason that my mother's getting honored for 50 years of service to a uh, organization in upstate New York that helps disabled people. So, you know, I can't really say, well, could you get honored next year because I'm busy this year for a special town meeting? So, and she doesn't even know what a short-term rental is. So there you go. So, um, so I will actually not be at that meeting. So Stephen will be chairing and um, yeah. And then after that, we have a meeting on the 26th, which will be hopefully when we get some motions done and otherwise the 28th is going to run into the 29th. That's all I can tell you. So we have only three meetings to do uh, all our recommendations, though some of them are zoning, so they're not ours. Jill. All right. I was just uh, speaking to the warrant because we're going to uh, be discussing this stuff in the future. Are there dollar amounts yet for like, I think the airport was asking money for design. Have they come up with a dollar figure yet? Or that's, that's later. Um, oh, so 
Yeah, sorry, Libby, but um, so the airport supplemental funding for the um, seasonal housing in the town's potential supplemental funding request for seasonal housing won't be known until the next, the potential need won't be known until the end of this month when the bids come in. Um, the bids were timed to come in at the end of the month so that we would be able to hold them through the November town meeting. Um, so that'd be part of a technical amendment then, Brian, right before the right town the meeting, technical. special town meeting? That's correct, Madam Chair, yes. Okay. So they, because they would need to, um, town administration has planned on them going at least to get a um, potential review by Capcom as well um, to take that through and to not subvert that process. So just on that point with, since we just approved money for them for this purpose in May, were they, did they look like before May to add money in for special town meeting once we announced a special town meeting or so the bids kind of got jammed? Well, they haven't actually put Not it money. out to bid the final estimate by um, the firm, the architectural firm um, pre-bid and the um, reviewed by the OPM have indicated that they will need supplemental funding, that they won't have enough. And that is consistent with what we've been hearing on our side with uh, modular construction. So I, I, I think that um, it's it's relatively um, will be needed. And, and so we're just waiting for those bids. Peter? Yeah, Denise, the quiet little ducklings of the short-term rental commission would like to know when they can come and address us, um, when, when we're going to really be discussing it in depth. Is it, Will it be the, the 21st or the 28th and 29th? So the because the public meeting is 21st, everything is up, right? We just go through and go, Article 1, does anybody want to say anything? Article 2, blah, well, Stephen will be doing that. Um, the yeah. other piece That's of the that, 20th. No. the 21st. That's our first meeting is the 21st, 21st, okay. 26th, and 28th. Okay. I would prefer to be there personally when we're going to do the majority of the discussion on the on the short-term rental art articles. So that means I think most of the um, discussion would be the 26th and it might spill over to the 28th if we don't finish, if we don't make recommendations on the 26th right, if we can't get through them on that day. So if they want, I would offer that if they want to come, it should be the 26th. Got it. Of course, go to any of the meetings and discuss it at will. You know, it's- No, open. understood. Yep, thank you. you. Uh, Denise, for one, I 100% I want you to be at that meeting. Um, yeah. But my yeah. other question for you, maybe through the chair, this is for Peter, whoever wants to answer. Peter, since your group is disbanded, how are you presenting this to us? Like, is that really a unified group or okay, is it the group, individuals? Okay. We, we had it, we had to become X because otherwise we couldn't meet without the open meeting rule, uh, which was a little absurd for us at this point because we had we handed in our product. You know, um, those of us on the committee, eight of the nine people, by the way, um, truly believe in what's going on and want to see it through to the end. So there's still a new committee called the X Short-Term Rental Working Group. Uh, <laughs> and and we are we are treated like we were before by the town as, as a, a spokesperson for this issue, but we are not, um, not the old group because we're missing one person and we're not under town regulation. So you're effectively under an advisory group of concerned citizens. Correct. Denise, could I please just mention that um, the, I guess it's not really the select board, but we were asked to help organize short-term rental info sessions. Saw that. Short-term rental warrant article info sessions. They're going to be on Thursday, October 5th at 4.30 and... Thursday, October 12th at 5.30. And the idea is that there would be a kind of a moderator who I believe is going to be Brooke Moore and members of the former short-term rental work group will be on a kind of a panel to help answer questions about different scenarios that people might have um, about their potential short-term rental questions. And we're also in the process, th that group has also developed some FAQs, which we are working into making them sort of graphically easy to understand and get on the website and put out on 
social media soon in three languages. So Libby, my question to you is, it's the 28th. We have four or five things that we weren't able to make a recommendation on. Are we able to add with enough, you know, public notice one more meeting before it's the drop dead date for the warrant to be closed for the special town meeting? Or do we just bring our pajamas in a sleeping bag for the 28th? Well, um, you should bring your PJs um, there because after the 28th, you, uh, this goes to the select board on October 4th, your motions, and they will make any comments. And then in order to get uh, the warrant printed and mailed within the time frame, it needs to be sent to the printer on Friday, October 6th. Okay. I just wanted to see if there's any, I just, I don't know how long, none of us know how long a piece of string is at this point, but none of us know how long that discussions could be on the first four articles or five articles. I don't have it in front of me that are really I mean, short term rentals. So um, I guess uh, while you're talking, I'm looking at my calendar, I guess if it were completely, you know, we have to have more time or else you could meet on Monday, the second, it would mean that if you made, if you didn't have final motions, they'd be going to the select board, you know, kind of last minute, but we could be passing along to them uh, along the way where you are. So, so that it's, but we'd need to know for posting purposes, kind of midweek, the week of the uh, 20. Um, I think we'll get it all done by the 28th. Honestly, we've never had to run over before. I don't think we'll have to run over now. I just, you know, this has been yeah. a unique special town meeting because of the topic. And I just wanted to know if there was any. any uh, there's a tiny bit of room. You you could potentially meet Monday. I, I, you see, when we did the timeline, of course, we didn't know how many articles there would be. Right. And there's more than we thought. Most of them are pretty straightforward, I hope. They should be, yes. Okay. All right. So that was combining item six, me next meetings and other business. Is there any other business before I ask for an adjournment? Okay, seeing no hands raised, I'm going to ask for an adjournment. So moved. <laughs> Second. Roll call. Peter, thank you, Jeremy. Uh, Peter. Aye. Jill. Aye. Stephen. Aye. Jeremy. Aye. Chris. Aye. Joanna. Aye. Myself, aye. As usual, thank you very much, everybody. Libby, Maria, Susan, Rick. Um, oh, Rob, sorry, I missed you, Rob. Aye. <laughs> <laughs> okay i'm out of practice to see who's on my screen all right everyone thank you very much and um i will personally see you on the 26th so good luck with the public hearing thank you thanks bye-bye